thank you, Dianata. Um, yeah, so like Dianata said, um, I'm going to be talking on the Pleasure Palace and the Four Sites. Um, but I'm just going to start off by talking about the goal, the goal of Buddhism um, is to transform our mind and to transform our hearts. Um, and to do that, we need to transform our whole being. Um, so Buddhism addresses itself to the whole human being. So it talks to the rational mind, so it talks with ideas, it talks with concepts, um, but it also speaks to our emotions. Um, so it speaks in images, it speaks in myths, it speaks in symbols, and it speaks in stories. Um, and stories are so, so important for human beings. So we're going to be listening to stories over the next few nights, stories from the Buddha's life. Um, and they're such important things for human beings. And there's a quote I really like from um, Philip Pullman, who said, after shelter, nourishment and companionship, stories are the thing we need most in the world. Um, which I really like that quote. Um, he is a bit biased because he's an author. Um, <laughs> but I do, think, I do think it's true. Um, and the stories, they have an emotional impact that um, ideas and concepts don't. And they're the main way that we can get emotion, our psychic and emotional energies behind a course of action um, or behind um, doing things. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be hearing stories. And there are a couple of um, dangers um, with stories. So one of the dangers is to take the metaphorical as literal. Um, but then there's also another danger of taking the metaphorical as not true. Um, so we kind of want to tread a path between those two things. What we want to do is let stories touch us. We want to let stories move us. Um, that's what they're designed to do. They're, de they're designed to speak to us on a deeper level. So when we're listening to the life story of the Buddha, we just want to hear the story and just let it touch us and let it move us. Because um, the story, so it has symbolical value. It has value of um, telling us truths that are universal. They're universal truths about the human condition. Um, and that's what, the Buddha, that's what the life story of the Buddha is for, is to talk to us about these universal truths. So the Buddha was born 2,500 years ago in India, um, and his name was Siddhartha Gautama. So he wasn't born the Buddha. He was born a man um, called Siddhartha Gautama, and he wasn't a god. Um, he wasn't an incarnated deity. He was just a human being, um, just like me and you. Um, and he was born into an important family, um, in, in India at the time, so in, in his region. Um, and his father was um, the, chief, the chief of the clan, sort of like, they were sort of the royal family. Um, and he, had been, he would have been well-educated, um, he would have been well-doted on by his um, father. They would have had quite an affluent life. Um, and yes, yeah, so you could read um, this as pointing to human birth is precious, um, human birth is fortunate, so we're born into this human life. And from a Buddhist perspective, a human birth is the most precious thing we can have. So we're really lucky to have this human birth. And you could see the um, Siddhartha being born into this royal family is um, symbolizing that, the fortunateness of a human birth. Um, and when he was born, it was the um, tradition in that society that when you had a child, you took them to a fortune teller. Um, to tell the truth, um, tell the future um, of what your child was going to have. So he took him um, to this fortune teller. He said, tell me what's my son going to be? What's going to happen um, to my son? Um, and the fortune teller um, looked at the boy. Um, he was very moved. He said, I see a great future um, for this boy. I see a great future for your son. Um, and he said, he will either be a great ruler um, of the land, just like you. He will continue... Um, He'll continue your reign and he'll be a great ruler. Or he will leave it all and become a spiritual master. Um, so there were these two things. There was he was either going to be um, a great ruler or he was going to be a spiritual master. Now, for us, I think we could see that, that we all have these two different options open to us. We have these different potentials. We have the potential um, to succeed in the world. We have... Um, a potential to gain status, um, to gain wealth, um, to gain riches, all of these things to succeed um, in worldly terms. Or we also have the potential to commit to ourselves to spiritual development, um, to working with our mind, expanding our consciousness. We have both of these opportunities available to us. And the, um, the fortune teller told the, um, yeah, your son, he'll either be a great ruler um, or a great spiritual master. 
Um, and his father was really excited about the prospect um, of him becoming a great ruler. And he was mortified um, of the thought of him becoming spiritual master. Um, and he was convinced that he needed to do anything he could um, to stop um, his son leaving and becoming a spiritual master. He was really certain he wanted his son um, to become the great ruler. So his father obviously thought, how am I going to do this? How am I going to make sure that my son doesn't leave um, to follow the spiritual life? And what he came up with was he built, um, he built a palace um, for um, Siddhartha. He actually built multiple palaces um, for Siddhartha, and they are all full of pleasures. Um, so he built him one palace for the summer and one palace for the winter, um, which meant that the temperature was never wrong, so he'd always be in the perfect temperature. And his palaces, they were full of food, and they were full of drink, and they were full of music, and supposedly they were full of dancing girls. Um, and so there's basically a party. I think it's, it sounds like it was just a party all the time um, in Siddhartha's palaces. Um, and his father was thinking, if, if he has everything he wants... Um, if he never wants for anything, if he can be surrounded by these pleasures all the time, um, he's never going to want to go off and do the spiritual thing. He'll have everything he needs here. He'll never have to ask the questions that will lead him um, to go and live the spiritual life. So when we hear about um, Siddhartha's situation there, we hear about having his multiple palaces, we have his music, his food, his dancing girls, we might think, oh, but I don't have that, um, I'm not in a problem. I don't have a pleasure palace. Um, but if you, if you actually start thinking about it, you see that actually our pleasure palace is probably even worse than Siddhartha's. Um, I was imagining if Siddhartha had a device in his pocket um, that could give him any song he wanted at any time, any film he wanted at any time, any erotic image he could possibly think of and just conjure it up in front of him. And if he could get food delivered um, within an hour, any, any type of food he wanted, whether it's Italian, Chinese, Mexican, he could just get, get it delivered in an hour. Um, or if he could think of anything he could possibly want, he could order it and it would be delivered to his door next day. Like, that would be absurd. Um, and so this is, this is the situation we're in. We, we are living um, in the pleasure palace. Our world is basically built to be a pleasure palace. We've got all of these things available to us. Anything we could possibly want, we can just get instantly. Now, it's not everything, but most things we could possibly need, um, we can get, and all sorts of entertainment. So, yeah, it's called the, the pleasure palace, and it's not that there's anything intrinsically wrong with pleasure. Um, there's nothing unspiritual about pleasure per se. But the problem with pleasure is that we use pleasure to distract ourselves from the uncomfortable truths of life. Um, we use pleasure to distract ourselves when really we should be looking at things. But it's like, oh, I feel quite sad, but I'm just going to go on my phone. Or um, I'm feeling a bit nervous about this, so I'm just going to go eat loads of popcorn. Um, it's things like that where it's like we could be looking at what's going on. We could be looking at the difficulty of our lives, um, but we can just go to pleasure to ignore it. Um, and the other problem um, with pleasure is that we feel, we think, um, that the pleasure we crave um, is going to ultimately satisfy us. Um, so I was living um, above the London Buddhist Centre a couple of years ago um, in a community there, and we bought um, an olive oil dispenser. Um, so we needed an olive oil dispenser, and then when it got delivered, um, <coughs> sorry, on the package it said, make incomplete life, perfect. <laughs> and it was an olive oil dispenser. Um, and the message was it, was it was going to make our incomplete lives perfect. Um, now, needless to say, it didn't fulfill its promise. Um, but this is basically what things are offering us all the time. Anything that's being sold to us, it's, it's trying to make us feel that our lives are incomplete, and if we get it, it's going to be perfect. And when we're craving for things, when we're grasping after things, that's what we think is going to happen. There's some sense of lack. There's some sense of unease. And it's like, if I get this thing, then I'll be happy. 
Um, now I can see I can see it in my life. There's just there is this view that if I can just manipulate my life in the right way, if I can just get everything in place, so if I can get the right flat, if I can get the right job, if I can get the right partner, if I can get the right hobbies, if I can get my calendar full but not too full, um, if I can get the right phone, if I can get the right computer, then I'll be happy. It's like if I can get everything in my life in place, then I'll be happy. And we go around with this view all the time. We don't know that we're doing this really, but this is what we're doing. We're trying to get everything in place. Now, there's a time when um, a few years ago, um, I, was, I was running a um, video production company and we were, um, it was going okay. We were, we were getting jobs, um, we were making things. It was quite fun. Um, but financially, it was um, really up and down, really stressful. And there was this view, there was this view that I was holding that it's like, oh, when I, get the, when I get the big job, then I'll be okay. Then I'll be safe. Then I'll be secure. So I basically spent my whole time in this anxious state thinking, oh, when I get that job that will pay me lots of money, then I'll be relaxed. Then I'll be happy. Then I'll be secure. Um, so we went a couple of years like that. And then eventually we got this email um, from a company and it was a really big job. It was like the biggest we'd um, ever ever done and it meant that if we got that job we'd be secure for months um, and we could just know that we we're financially secure which was really unusual for us. Um, and obviously we were very excited. So, oh, this is what we've been waiting for. I've been doing all of this work. Um, now we're going to get the big job that's going to make me feel secure um, and happy. And we were doing the emails um, and it looked like it was getting more and more likely. I was getting more anxious. Um, and then eventually the email went through. They confirmed, yes, we're going to do it. Um, we're going to do the job with you. Um, we're happy to pay you this amount of money. And at first it was like, amazing, we've got it. We've got what I wanted. And then a few moments later, it was like, oh, I still feel exactly the same. It's like all this thing that I was moving towards, this big job that was going to make me feel secure, um, that was going to make me happy. It was everything I've been working towards. When I got there, um, I just felt exactly the same. I still felt anxious. I still felt insecure. Um, still didn't feel like everything was in place. And I think for me, that was a um, big turning point where, um, yeah, I just saw that just trying to manipulate my life, just trying to get everything in place, um, just wasn't going to work um, in the way that I thought it was going to. So yeah, Siddhartha, um, he, was living, he was living in his palace. Um, by the end of the time that he was in his palace, he also had a wife. His father arranged a marriage for him, um, and he had a child. Um, so on the face of it, Siddhartha had everything, um, everything he could want. He had all of these luxuries of life. He had a nice family. Um, he was well looked after. Um, but despite, despite all these pleasures, um, he still wasn't satisfied there was still a sense of like, oh, this can't be it. There needs to be more than this. There needs to be more to life than these pleasures, than this, than this comfort. Um, so he decided to um, leave the palace. Um, he decided to leave the palace and go into town um, to see what, what else was there to life. Um, now, in a way, we've, um, we've all chosen um, to leave the pleasure palace here. Um, we've all come on retreat um, at a time when we could be um, doing other things. Um, and we've chosen to leave those situations that are comfortable to us, leave the situations where we can get all of those pleasures. Um, and we've put ourselves in a situation where we've taken away um, all the usual ways to distract ourselves. We've turned off our phones. Um, we can't communicate with um, people in the way that we normally do. Um, digitally and with all the family and friends that we're used to. Um, we can't watch Netflix. We can't listen to music in the same way. We've kind of like all of those things that we're used to distracting ourselves with, that we create our pleasure palace with, um, we've taken ourselves away from, which is such a, um, it's an opportunity um, to start to look at those questions that a lot of the time we're just distracting ourselves from, the questions that we're normally avoiding. Um, and start to turn towards our mind. Um, yeah, so it's such a, um, such a rich opportunity. Um, but we will, um, even in this situation, um, we will start to build a new pleasure palace. 
Um, wherever we go, whatever we're doing, we're going to be building a pleasure palace. Um, so on our tenth slice of toast um, that's covered in jam, um, we could ask ourselves, am I actually hungry? Um, do I actually need this tenth slice of toast? Um, or am I using it to distract myself? Is this my new pleasure palace? Um, have I replaced um, all my normal things with toast? Um, so yeah, he decided um, to leave the palace um, and go into town um, with his father's charioteer. Um, so I'm sure we can all relate to when we go into town with our father's charioteer. Um, so he went, he went into the town and he went um, out into the people, um, which um, the story tells it that this was a very rare occasion. Um, so his father heard that his son, his father heard that his son was leaving the palace um, so he kind of got all of the guards out. He laid down the um, red carpet metaphorically. He was like, oh, let's see him out. So it was obviously something um, that Siddhartha hadn't done before. Um, so, and he went out into town. And yeah, as, as he was traveling around, so it was him, him and um, his father's charioteer, and he was traveling around, um, and then eventually he, um, he saw something that shocked him. Um, he saw a man that was kind of withered looking. Um, he was bent over and he had, he had bones um, sticking out of his body. Um, and it was an old man. Um, it was an old man who had obviously aged so much that his bones were withered. He was bent over. Um, his skin was tight. Um, and Siddhartha was shocked. Um, he was shocked to see this, and he said to um, the charioteer, um, what's, happened? what's happened to him? What's happened to this man? Um, and the charioteer said, ah, um, he's, he's old. Um, he's grown old. Um, and Siddhartha, Siddhartha asked, why has that happened? Um, and the charioteer said to him, well, that, that happens to everyone. Um, everybody grow old, grows old. Um, and Siddhartha said, e Everyone? He's like, yes, everyone, I'm going to grow old, your father's going to grow old, you're going to grow old. And Siddhartha, Siddhartha was shocked. He's like, even me, my, myself, I'm going to grow old like that. And he said, yes, yes, everyone grows old. And Siddhartha was shocked to the core. Um, he was shaken to the core. Um, he'd, never, he'd never seen this before. Um, and suddenly he had, all of these, he had all of these pleasures in his life before and suddenly he was struck by the fact of old age. Um, he was struck by the fact that he was going to grow old. Um, so he went, back, he went back to the palace um, and yeah, I think he would have reflected um, on what he'd seen. Um, and yeah, he was quite shaken by this and I imagine that when he was now um, in his palace he wasn't seeing things in quite the same way. All the things that used to have... Um, the allure to it probably just didn't seem um, to have the, have the pleasure that they used to. Um, but eventually he decided, oh, no, I do want to go out again. I want to go out again into the world um, and see what there is there. Um, so again, he went out um, with the charioteer and um, he was traveling around the town. And then eventually he saw a sick man um, lying um, on the roadside um, in some sort of painful fever, um, so he was lying there, drenched in sweat, in lots of pain, um, writhing on the floor. And again, Siddhartha hadn't seen this before. And he said, what, what's happened to this man? Um, he said, well, this, this man is sick. And he said, what, why has that happened? And he says, well, well, everyone gets sick. And again, Siddhartha said, who does that happen to? And he says, it's going to happen to everyone. And he said, even me, yes. Yes, even you, you're going to get sick. And then he, um, again, returned back to the palace. Um, again, so he was struck um, by sickness for the first time. So he'd seen old age, um, and he was shaken. Then he came back, and he saw sickness, um, and he was shaken. And I think there was um, something, something deep stirring in Siddhartha, some deep unease um, with these things that he'd seen for the first time. And then finally, he decided, no, I'm going to go out again. I'm going to go out and see... Um, what else is there um, in the world? And then eventually, so he was traveling around and then he saw four men um, carrying a stretcher. Um, and on that stretch stretcher, there was a corpse on there. There was a man lying there dead. 
Um, and again, he said, what, what's happened? What's happened? And the charioteer said, this man has died. And he said, well, is that going to happen to me? And he's like, yes. Yes, that's going to happen to everyone. So then again, he returned to the palace. And so, yeah, in these incidents, it's said that um, Siddhartha um, was seeing them for the first time. So he'd had this sheltered life, he'd had this sheltered upbringing, which meant that he'd never had to face these facts before. He'd never had to face um, the fact of old age. He'd never had to face the fact of sickness. And he'd never um, had to face the fact of death. Now, it might not have been um, that Siddhartha had never seen or heard of them before. He might have heard of old age, sickness and death. But it's like he, for this time, he saw it for the first time deeply. It was as if he'd seen it for the first time. And so I was, I was thinking about my um, encounters with death. Um, and actually, from quite a young age, a lot, all of my grandparents died when I was quite young. Um, and I encountered death for the first time, and I think I must have been around two or three. Um, so I was really young um, when one of my grandmas died. Um, and I remember being sat um, on my parents' bed um, with my parents. So I was sat there on the bed. My brother was there and my parents were there. And all three of them were crying. Um, so we'd found out that she'd died. And all three of them were crying. Now, I knew um, that she'd died, but I didn't actually understand what death was. Um, so I wasn't crying. I was watching them. And I could see, ah, yes, yeah, something's happened. Um, I know that she's died, and I can see that this is an important thing, but it didn't, I didn't understand it. Um, I was quite young, and I didn't understand it, but I, really, I remember it really vividly, being like, ah, yes, yeah, something big um, has happened here, but it didn't touch me um, in a way because I couldn't understand it. Um, and then a few years later, um, a similar, well, my other grandma died, um, and this time it was in, in my bedroom. My mum came and sat on my bed and she told me, oh, um, your grandma's died. Um, and this time I was old enough to, to understand it a bit and I did, I did start crying this time and I was crying with her. And I started asking her, like, oh, is it, is it possible to bring people back to life? Um, is it possible that although people die, can, can we bring her back to life? Um, and then we kind of had a bit of light conversation about rich people freezing their bodies um, so that in the future, um, maybe they could be reborn. Um, and then after a while, my mum, my mum just had to be like, no, no, this time she's, she's not coming back. Um, and this is the moment where I think I really saw, I did see death for the first time. It was like this time I'd really understood, oh no, death means that you're not coming back. When someone dies, that actually means that they're not coming back. Um, and that was, yeah, that was the first time I think I'd really encountered death. So in our lives, we are going to encounter um, old age, sickness and death. And we'll, we'll probably encounter them a lot in our lives. Um, but most of the time, um, we're going to be like me when my first grandma died, really. We might see it. Um, we might hear the words. We might understand what's happened intellectually. And we might even um, feel sorry and feel empathy for the people involved. Um, but it, the reality of it won't really touch us. The reality of death, old age and sickness won't really touch us. Um, we kind of think, oh no, not me, um, not my life, not the people in my life. Um, but it's only when someone close to us dies or when some big sickness touches us individually um, that we really see the reality um, of old age, sickness and death more clearly. And in that moment, we might really see it um, might, might really let us touch us on a deeper level. Now, um, sickness and death um, are inevitable um, for all of us. Old age, old age isn't inevitable, but all of us will experience decay um, in some way. And these are, these are the facts of life that we try to avoid. Um, these are the facts of life that often we'll be building our palace um, to avoid and we all have to face. And no matter how much success, um, how much wealth and fame um, and pleasure we get in this life. We can't avoid these facts. We can't avoid the facts um, of old age, sickness, and death. And the first, the first of these three sites is um, they're inevitable for all of us. No, so um, they symbolize they symbolize impermanence. So these are one of the te the teachings of the Buddha is the teachings of impermanence. 
Um, and they also um, symbolize our suffering um, in response to impermanence. Um, so we suffer, we suffer when we try and hold on to something um, that we can't. We suffer when we try and hold on to something that's impermanent. Um, so we grasp at youth, we grasp at health, and we grasp at life. Um, but they're always going to be slipping through our fingers. Um, we, we can never actually hold on to them. Because impermanence is a universal truth. So it applies um, to everything in life. We can't hold on to anything. There's always going to be things that we're trying to grasp onto. Um, but we can't. We can't hold on to things because they're impermanent. But the more we try and grab them, the more we try and grasp onto them, the more we're going to suffer. Um, but there is an antidote um, to this suffering. Um, there is an antidote to this unsat unsatisfactory unsatisfactoriness. Um, and this is what the Buddha saw next. Um, so he went out again um, for another time. So he'd seen these three sites and he thought, oh, I'm going to go out again. Um, I'm going to go out and see what there is in the world. Um, he's obviously still searching. He was still searching um, for the answers. So he went out again. Um, and then on the road... Um, he saw a wandering holy man. Um, so he saw a man who had been in um, kind of ragged robes, um, shaven head, probably quite dirty, um, walking along the road um, completely at peace. He saw this man, and this man was completely at peace. Um, and there was quite a tradition um, at this time. In the Buddha's time, there were lots of people that were doing this. There were lots of people that were um, seekers, basically. They'd left the household life. Um, to go and search for the truth. Um, and he saw one of those men. He saw a man um, that was completely at peace walking along. Um, and the Buddha thought, this man has no home. This man has no belongings. He has no wealth. He has no status. But he looks completely happy. And he said, I want what he has. I want what he has. I want that peace um, that that wandering man has. So the wandering, the wandering holy man, um, he represents the antidote um, to this suffering. He represents the antidote to this suf um, suffering that we get from grasping after pleasure um, and the pain that we experience from impermanence. Um, and he symbolizes a different way of being. He symbolizes a way of being where the answers are found on the inside rather than in the external world, from working on his mind um, to find the truth, rather than always grasping at everything outside. And he symbolizes changing our lives to find freedom. Um, so it's not just an idea. He doesn't just have an idea of freedom. This wandering holy man changed his life um, to find freedom. Now, when um, beginning a spiritual journey, um, many of us will be motivated to try and alleviate our suffering. Um, so we have this suffering, and understandably, we want to do something about it. We don't want to suffer. We want to be able to be free um, from the pain and the suffering that we experience. And we go to spirituality. We go to working with our mind to try and working on our suffering. And this is perfectly understandable, and it's a really good motivation um, for getting on the path. But eventually, um, there will need to be, at least before too long, a positive vision as well. So it's not enough just to be driven by the suffering. It's not enough just to be driven to try and get out of suffering. We also need to have a positive vision um, for what our lives can be. Um, and we need to have an inspiring vision that helps us to pursue um, that life. Now, for me, I had a couple of um, experiences that I describe as those kind of foresight um, experiences, um, experiences where I kind of saw, saw a different way of being that inspired me um, to move my life in a different direction. Um, now, the first one was... Um, it was, it was on my first retreat. It was a week-long retreat. Um, and I'd been meditating a lot more than I normally meditated. Um, and kind of like I'd turned off my phone, just like we've done, um, and was just working on my mind, um, just meditating a few times a day. And then eventually I was sat um, in... It was kind of like a clearing. It was in nature, and there was this clearing, and I was sat on a log. Um, and I could, see, I could see the sun setting in the distance. There was trees, and I could see the sun setting in the distance. Then all of a sudden, I just felt a peace um, that came from inside of me. Um, for so much of my life, I'd been driven um, to succeed. Um, I'd been driven to be productive. Um, I'd always wanted to achieve things externally. 
Um, but at this moment, I just knew that what I was feeling was completely unrelated to all the external things I'd done, and it was just coming from within. There was this feeling of peace that I felt so deeply, and I just, in that moment, I knew, ah, oh, this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. This feeling is what I want to move my life towards. Um, and it was just that, that moment did spark me really trying to go into um, my mind, go into looking at my life. How can I work um, with my mind in my life to improve? And I think this moment was what really started me um, going down the spiritual path. Um, and the other one was um, meeting someone who's actually a good friend of mine now. But this was also um, on one of the early retreats that I was on. Um, and it's a um, man called Styromanis. And um, he... He'd basically, he'd been a theatre director, um, and he'd done quite well. He'd been quite successful um, up to this point, but he had this, he had this feeling like, oh, there must be more to life than this. This success I'm getting isn't getting me um, where I want to go. Um, and he'd actually left his career um, to commit his life to Buddhism and commit his life to the London Buddhist Centre. Um, and for me, that was a time where I saw, oh, this is actually, this is a life I can live. This isn't just something I can do in my free time. Um, it's not just something that I can read about and then just get on with my life. It's like I can actually live this life. And this was the first person I'd met who'd really orientated his life fully towards that. Um, and that's what I was wanting to do. I just didn't know how to do it. Um, so I think this moment where I felt that peace and I knew, ah, oh, this is the most important thing. Um, and then seeing someone um, who was living that and was orientating his life around that, that were really the, they were the fourth sights for me that inspired me. Um, to go down the path. <coughs> and so, yeah, we are going to be driven to try and alleviate our suffering. Um, we are going to be trying to move away from suffering, but we also need to be being inspired. Um, we need to be seeing a positive vision that we want to move our lives towards. Um, and different people will be inspired by different things. <coughs> and our inspirations will change um, over time, but there are so many things um, that we can be inspired by um, in the spiritual life. Now, first of all, we could be inspired by the life of the Buddha. Um, we can be inspired by the example of the Buddha, um, the life that he lived, the effect that he had in the world. Um, we can learn about the Buddha and we can be inspired by the Buddha. <coughs> um, we can also be inspired by other people. Um, for me, the people who have been practicing longer than me have been such a source um, of inspiration in my spiritual life. I'm um, seeing people that have gone through things that I'm now going through and are bearing the fruits of that consistent practice over a number of years. They've been such a source um, of inspiration to me. And also practicing alongside friends and seeing friends transform. Um, there's people who came along at the same time as me and then seeing them grow and seeing them change has been such a source of inspiration. Um, we could also be inspired by the, um, the ideal of wisdom um, so seeing into the truth of things, um, seeing into the nature of reality and therefore freeing ourselves. Um, we could be inspired by compassion um, to alleviate the suffering of all beings. Um, we could be inspired by the vision of building a better life. Um, early on in the movement, there was a really strong emphasis on and we're building a new society. We want to build a world um, where everything is conducive to spiritual development. And we can still find that inspiring. That's still what we're doing here. Basically, what we're trying to do here on this retreat is to build a world where everything is conducive um, to spiritual development. We're trying to build a world where we can be for however long, five, ten days, where everything is conducive to spiritual development. So we can be inspired by uh, the vision of building a better world. Um, we can be inspired by a higher life, a vision of a higher life, a life of beauty, um, a life of meaning. Um, that's what we can be trying to move towards. We can be inspired by a vision of ourselves, but transformed. Ourselves transformed into an embodiment of wisdom and compassion. So we can develop wisdom, we can develop compassion, and we can embody that. We could be inspired by the vision of the whole of humanity fulfilling its potential. We all want to fulfill our potential, but we could be inspired by every human being uh, being able to fulfill its potential. We could be inspired by the vision of humanity without greed, without hatred, without confusion. We can be inspired by humanity filled with love and filled with generosity through practicing, through working on their mind, increasing their love, increasing their generosity. 
And we can be inspired by curing the world's sicknesses, not by trying to treat the causes, no, trying, by treating the causes rather than the symptoms. There's so many things in the world, we're trying to help the world by trying to cure the symptoms. Whereas with the Dharma, what we're trying to do, we're trying to cure the causes. We're trying to work on our minds to, get, um, to transform our greed, to transform our hatred, to transform our confusion, so then we can change the world from there. Um, so, yeah, we can be inspired by so many different things um, in the spiritual life. Um, and, yeah, these, these four sites, um, so there was old age, sickness, and death, um, but there was also the possibility um, to be free from them and a path to be free from them. Now, these were in the Buddha's life story as um, like a significant point in his life. Um, and we might have experiences like that as well. We might have times where we think, oh, yeah, this was, a, this was one of the four sites for me. Um, but really, they also need to be going on all the time. So these four sites need to be continually going on on deeper and deeper levels. So we need to be realizing more and more deeply how um, trying to configure our lives to get pleasure and pain isn't going to work. Um, how trying to avoid, avoid the pain and gain pleasure, that's not going to work. Um, and we also need to be inspired um, by a vision of a higher life um, and be trying to move ourselves more and more towards that higher vision. Yes, I'll leave that there. Thank you.